makes it more energy efficient. Oh. <coughs> so this is the process. So Okay, um, welcome back. Let's begin. So, my any question before we begin? Any concern that I can address before we start? Exam 4, when I do the review, I will 
ask specific questions about that. And, and uh, by the time that particular phase of our class comes, uh, please have some questions. If you think that there are certain things that you want to discuss about exam four or some questions, please raise them. But I would like to now take the opportunity to talk about externality and public goods, uh, which is a pretty important idea. Uh, I had some, uh, you know, sort of, sort of desire to include externality in your sort of ongoing cost, you know, as part of the exams. I, I did not because, you know, sometimes these are materials and ideas that you're looking for the first time, and I didn't want to analyze it. So externality, when you look at that, the, the, the term uh, is, uh, you know, kind of formal, uh, but when you look at the definition, uh, it kind of makes sense. You know, we, are, we all know what externality is. So a cost or a benefit that affects uh, a party not directly involved in the transaction. So uh, let's start with an example. Uh, let's say somebody is smoking and there is a guy standing next to the guy who is smoking. So the guy who is not smoking but is being affected by the smoking, we call them, of course, him a secondhand smoker, is an example of externality. Yes. The action is undertaken by the smoker, but the effect is, impo is being imposed on the second person for which the person <coughs> is not being compensated. We will talk about the compensation you know, uh, uh, in, in, in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. But that is basically the <coughs> kind of externality that uh, we all have experienced and we all are aware. These are examples of what we call negative externality. Uh, act actions that impose a cost on other people or the society for which we really don't pay any fine. But then there are some other kinds of externality as well, which we call positive externality. Uh, think about two uh, for industry like the bee industry and the flower industry that are side by side. In most of the cases, they are in close proximity with each other, and you can. And uh, the production of bees have a positive impact on the production of flowers through pollination. Now, uh, if you are raising bees, you really don't get paid <coughs> by the flower industry uh, you know, to increase your production of bees. Although that mechanism has changed over time, now what uh, you know, flower producers do is that they pay the bee producers so that they can bring their bees and help pollinate the flowers. Uh, but the, in the original form, this is example of a positive externality. And it, uh, the, where your action exerts a positive impact on someone else's for which the other person doesn't pay you. Are you clear on that? Now, the reason why I wanted to include externality in the context of an EMBA course is because the framework that we are talking about now extends to not only this physical production, but extends to a wide variety of different problems that we face in our life and in our business community. And, and uh, you know, our, the, 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 the extent to which externality uh, is discussed uh, could be extended as high as thinking about information, how you can have some information and somebody could steal that information from you without paying you. Uh, and that would be uh, uh, an exactly a kind of externality problem that we're talking about. Are we all clear on that? So if somebody buys a pirated CD, that is basically a negative externality. Right? <coughs> okay. So with that, let us now move on. Um, so, the first reason why we talk about externality is that externality always creates distortion in the market. Let's try to understand it from a philosophical perspective rather than going into math. We will look at some graph, but the intuition is most important. So you have uh, some actions for which there are no compensation or there are no benefits. So some of the actions is not included in the equilibrium. <coughs> And that is a problem, right? Because what it does is that whenever you have some kind of externality, either positive or negative, there is a divergence between the benefit or the cost of the society versus an individual. 
What does that mean? It means that when you are smoking, uh, you know, you are you obviously are doing harm to yourself, but that's beyond the that's not the consideration from the point of consideration here. Yeah? When you smoke, you also affect other people in the society, and for which the cost is not only your cost. But the social cost is uh, 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 an important issue as well. So what happens is that when you have an externality, the social cost and the individual cost are not the same. So you might think that by smoking, you are only paying the price of the cigarette and the future expected uh, health cost that you are going to incur. You are wrong. Because by smoking, you are also imposing cost on the society. And that is where the problem is. As a result of externality, either positive or negative, we will always have social inefficiency. Inefficiency in the market, where there will be dead weight loss and all those inefficiency issues that we have learned before. Um, the best way, and I think uh, probably a systematic way of looking at externality and how it uh, causes social inefficiency uh, should be analyzed in a graphical setup. Um, so let me guide you through that. Uh, before we look at social inef in a, uh, inefficiency as a result of externality, I guess we need to develop a little, uh, some new concept. Um, you know, we have you know, systematically talked about benefits and costs in, in, in many of the chapters, uh, where we talked about the benefit of an action being reflected by the price, the cost of the action being reflected by the you know the cost the, the cost of product producing something. So every model that we have looked at in the cost chapters in the profit chapter talked uh, extensively about cost and benefit, but we never distinguish between two kinds of cost: private cost versus social cost, and private benefit versus social benefit. Now, social benefit or social cost basically is the cost that is imposed on the society or benefit received by the society. So what is a society then? Well, this would have a, a, a various different kind of interpretation. For our case, a society is the sum of individuals living in that particular society. That's what a society is. It's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's an invisible concept, right? You don't see a society. But you know that the society exists because the society is the sum of individuals. So, if we believe that, then the social cost will be the sum of individual cost, and social benefit will be the sum of individual benefit. Make sense? Okay, so how does the distinction between social cost and social, uh, you know, and, and private cost, and social benefit and private benefit affect the market equilibrium? and leads to inefficiency. Uh, let's look at this particular example, uh, particular case in an example, in an example of an electricity market. So, so an electricity market is basically we're talking about the quantity of electricity that are being uh, purchased and the price of that electricity. By the way, electricity is an externality example because anytime you produce electricity, you create pollution, big time, right? When you convert, uh, you know, solar power or you convert, uh, you know, nuclear power into electricity, obviously there are pollutions associated with that. Uh, so anytime there is a, but electricity is something that is uh, a basic necessity for a lot of industrial production. Without, without electricity, you cannot run a lot of engines. So if the, there was no externality, <coughs> the, the actions that are being taken by the electricity producers had no secondary effect on the market, uh, our market equilibrium would, lie, would look like the one that you're looking at. It would be identical to what we have learned in the previous chapters. You know, you have a standard demand curve. You have a standard supply curve, and the intersection determines the market equilibrium price and quantity. Now, since the actions that we're talking about are, are actions that generate further actions and further effects and further benefits, our market equilibrium will be stopped. It will change a little bit. Okay, and let's try to understand now how does that happen. Okay, um, if you think about the red line as the supply curve, which you know is basically a segment of the marginal cost curve, we can think of this marginal cost curve as 
the cost curve of an individual who is basically you know, causing the air pollution or some form of pollution. Now his cost of production is very different from the cost of production to the society, right? Because as a result of his actions, he is imposing this EMC, which is basically the cost of externality onto the society. So the red line is the supply curve or the cost function for the individual, and the yellow line is the cost curve for the society. And you can see that the cost to the society for every unit of electricity being produced is higher than private cost. This is a classic example of a negative externality. The effect of negative externality is pretty obvious. When the supply curve shifts up, you can see that the equilibrium price goes down, uh, goes up, and the equilibrium quantity goes down. So, as a result of externality, the society pays more for the electricity, and the society produces less electricity, then the competitive market outcomes. Since there is underproduction now, as a result of negative externality, we will obviously have some kind of economic inefficiency, which is basically summarized by this triangular area called the net weight loss, which we have seen before. So in our previous uh, look at these issues, we were looking at taxes and how taxes create net weight loss. In this case, net weight loss is created by the externality. So it's a big problem. Because externality creates social inefficiency. Uh, from an economics perspective, therefore, the next natural step is to think about how we can solve the externality problem. But I want to mention that the discussion that we are, that are going to follow is not only for <coughs> economic reasons. Uh, externality and the associated discussions are important for not only policy, policy discussion, it is also important for us. Right? Because you know we are all part of that society. Anytime there is a negative externality, we are hurt by it. Anytime there are activities that generate positive externality like education, we are benefited by that. So we need to understand those. But let's start with the economic discussion and then we are going to expand our discussion later on. So um, we have looked at um, this uh, efficiency uh, loss uh, under externality. What do we do? How do we solve it? How do we solve the externality problem? You detect. Okay, uh, this will be part of our ongoing discussion. <coughs> but I want to start from a slightly different point, and we will go there. Exactly what you were saying. Um, and I and before I talk about uh, start this part, I want to tell you a story about one of my peers who teaches at. University of Western Ontario. She is one of the leading uh, labor economists around the world. And what she does, she looks at uh, violence against women as you know her research idea. A very controversial topic. And um, she is both an empirical and a theoretical person, and she does a lot of modeling work where she looks at domestic violence as as a as, as an equilibrium outcome. Okay, so rather than looking at uh, measures or policies that could uh, eliminate domestic violence, uh, Robin Sickle, that's her name, she's looking at what would be their optimal level of domestic violence. You can see clearly that it's a fairly controversial concept because anyone who doesn't understand what she's doing might think that she's promoting domestic violence. She's not. Like the accept of that rate. Absolutely. And that's what we are going to start to deal with. So in an idealistic world, in a world where uh, you know there are uh, certain conditions that are being met, the optimal or ideal or efficient level of externality would be zero level of externality. Right. Can we achieve that? The answer is no. Right? Because anytime you walk on a road, you create externality. Isn't that right? You are creating soil erosion, and that's a form of externality. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so anytime you, you know, you want to enjoy some form of electric device, you are creating externality. So externality is part of our life. Since we cannot have zero level of externalities, it is an obvious natural iteration of policy to ask 
what would be the efficient level of externality. Now, what does that mean for us? What is what does it mean for us to have an efficient level of externality from a, from a philosophical perspective? Is that something that minimizes cost on the society? And that is a hundred percent correct answer. So rather than thinking about minimizing the level of externality, we are basically changing our focus and we are trying to find the <coughs> minimum possible externality that is acceptable by the society or that is basically guaranteed by the market system that that can be sustainable these are things that people talk about by the way the discussion that we're having has a very broad application and in due time probably in the second half of the uh, you know first half of the second session we will talk a little bit about application and how and where you see applications of this Okay, so the efficient level of externality uh, can be uh, discussed if you are, if you look at some kind of example like an efficient level of pollution. So what would be the efficient level of pollution? It cannot be a zero level of pollution, but it also cannot be too high. So let's look at how economists look at that efficient level of pollution. Okay, uh, the way economists answer this very important question is that the efficient level of pollution will be found where the marginal social cost of pollution is equal to <coughs> the benefit of social uh, of externality. Well, so what does that mean? So we understand the cost part. What's the benefit part? Who benefits from the so externality anyway? No one. So if you are polluting the you know air or the you know, water or you know, whatever kind of pollution you are causing, uh, you are imposing a cost on someone else, right? Unless you give out the profit out of the Right. So one could see the potential beneficiaries and, and the potential group that are being hurt by <coughs> pollution. Right? So there are obvious two sides of the say of, of every story. So the efficient level of extra pollution will be found where these two sides basically agree on a price for the actions that are being caused. So example would be uh, you pollute air, you cause cancer. So if uh, somebody gets cancer from you, you pay for all the medical expenses of that person and that could be an efficient level of smoking that you are causing. In a minute, we are going to expand that idea a little bit. But are we uh, are we clear on how economists look at this <coughs> mechanism? This is not a perfect mechanism. There are a lot of criticisms about it. We will talk about them. But does it make sense <coughs> from a philosophical perspective? Is it an economic way of looking at this fundamental problem in our society? OK. Um, so, as long as the cost of pollution is equivalent to the benefit of pollution, um, which is basically increased production or whatever the firm is undertaking, uh, you would be fine. You would not complain because you know that this is the efficient level of pollution. Now, that leads, uh, takes us to sort of like a graphical illustration of the, of the externality. Now, even if you do not remember the graphs, please at least remember the arguments, because these arguments can shape the way you look at these problems. Uh, when we look at efficient level of pollution, we always call it the second best solution, because the first best solution is zero pollution, which you cannot have. So you are stuck with a second best solution where you are basically trying to have the minimum possible pollution in your world as possible. And that can be found where the marginal cost of pollution is equal to the marginal benefit. Now, it is sometimes a little bit tricky to understand who is on the demand side or the marginal benefit side and who is on the supply side or the marginal cost side. The marginal benefit side basically consists of people who gain from this pollution, so farms profit makers, uh, anyone who is involved in that production. And the marginal cost are people who are being penalized as a result of these activities. This is an example of negative externality. When we move to, move to the positive externality, the beneficiaries and the affected groups are going to switch. Something that we're going to talk about later. So on the graph, it looks very straightforward. You just find a way 
that the marginal cost and the marginal benefit of pollution are equal. As a result, you are going to get a price P4, which will tell you the equilibrium price for pollution and equilibrium quantity for star is the efficient level of pollution or externality. Um, in reality, this is not simple because you really cannot have markets like that. What's the problem with this graph? There are plenty of problems in this graph, right? First of all, this graph assumes that people who are on the beneficiary side uh, are willing to work with people who are, who are on the cost side. So if you are a firm that is polluting the uh, you know, water of a river upstream and there is a downstream fisherman whose fishes are dying because of the pollution, it is highly unlikely that if the fisherman asks the firm to stop polluting the water, the firm will do that. Most importantly, the firm probably, the fisherman probably never have seen the farm owners and the farm owners have never interacted with the fishermen because they probably live 2,000 miles apart. Are we all clear on that? That's only one part, one part of the problem that we are talking about. There's a special problem in who is being affected by the externality and who is benefiting from the externality. When the Chernobyl uh, plant in Russia exploded in 1984, I was in fourth grade, and my country is like 10,000 miles away from Russia, nowhere close, right? And uh, after the Chernobyl uh, you know, so explosion, the entire European milk production, which, were, you know, which was happening on the other side of the globe, in Sweden, uh, in Finland, in, in all these uh, you know, countries, most of them basically lost their entire market share from the world because there were traces of uh, contamination found in those milk. So my country, Bangladesh, which was like 20,000 miles away from where the explosion took place, basically banned uh, you know, importing milk from these European countries. Notice what is happening, right? Explosion happening here, production being affected by there, consumers being affected here. Fundamentally three different places being affected by one event. How are you going to bring all these people together and have this you know, idealistic copy book solution to your externality problem? It's impossible. But we try, right? And you know, somebody has to try, somebody has to find a mechanism to address these issues. There are various ways governments and private sector agencies and policymakers have suggested ways to solve externality problems. And we are going to slowly look at all of them. The first most common approach of solving externality would be what we call a price mechanism, which is uh, you know, actions that you take that will distort the price or change the price in such a way that uh, you know, we find this efficient level of pollution or externality. Uh, one mechanism that could be classified as a pricing mechanism is to tax. Whoever pollutes or creates negative externality is being taxed so that he corrects his decisions and somehow, uh, you know, minimizes the amount of externality that he's creating. <coughs> Simple idea. And a very effective idea, right now. Okay, um, now we need to be aware that there are also examples of positive externality. What do you do when some actions are getting positive effects on the economy? What do you do? What do you usually do in our economy? Sorry? Yeah, how? Very good. So it's maybe a tax break? Absolutely, right. So tax is basically a way to discourage the production of negative externality. The opposite side would be to provide subsidy to encourage more of those positive externality. And you can see that being implemented, right? Education is a classic example of a positive externality. If you are educated, uh, you teach your children how to be you know, more civic and they get some kind of peer group effect from you. That's an externality effect. 
So you want to encourage that, that kind of education accumulation or human capital accumulation by subsidy. Makes sense? Okay. These are very clear cut mechanisms through which you try to limit negative externality or encourage positive externality. Uh, that takes us to a very interesting discussion about uh, about first of the three uh, Nobel uh, Prize winning work that we are going to cite in this paper, uh, in this discussion. So the first one refer, you know, get, uh, gives reference to this French economist in the 1970s. So when we were undergraduate students, we used to make fun of this name because we could not pronounce it. It's a French name. And I've never, you know, uh, I, I don't know, know any French uh, speaking person, we used to have very weird, you know, pronunciation of that name. And but regardless of how peculiar the name is, um, uh, he basically changed the way, uh, you know, government and policymakers look at externally. Now his argument was that in order to limit or encourage external effects or activities, you can use tax. But the tax that he's talking about are fundamentally different than the tax that you and I pay in the form of income tax, sales tax, and so on. So we need to understand the distinction. So his argument was that we are imposing tax on negative externality or imposing subsidy on positive externality not to distort production, but to bring back these activities to an efficient level. And they're different. So his <coughs> argument was that even if you use taxes, which are generally disdained, disliked by people because they distort economic activities, they are not really you know, distorting economic activities. They are just distorting the amount of externality that is being created. Make sense? Are we? And there's a twist there. Do we all see that? So he is basically proposing for this kind of direct government intervention, and at the same time arguing that they are not going to create distortion for the society. They are basically uh, benefiting the society. And you can see traces of normative or ethical argument there, right? This is not entirely an economic argument. Obviously, he is uh, making argument that goes beyond our traditional economics. He is basically making a larger, you know, you know sort of, uh, you know, argument in favor of government intervention. In order to really explore Pigu, the effect of Pigu, we all we need to do is look at Europe. The entire European policy towards environmental pollution since the 1980s is single-handedly influenced by Pigu. This is how important he is. He got a Nobel Prize at a very early stage of his, of his life. Okay, uh, so that's basically the, the effect on prices that uh, are regularly invoked, probably not in USA to that extent, but very, very aggressively in European countries. <coughs> where most of the European countries have mechanisms where government officials go to the various you know, production units, they estimate how much air pollution is being done by them, and they find them right, right, right there and there. Right? Are we? It, it, it seems like a good mechanism. Obviously, it has flaws. Before I move on to the next one, I want to understand how do you look at this sort of direct government kind of intervention in solving externality problem through price mechanism. How how do you see that? We already have seen some positive effects. Obviously, otherwise the, most of the European countries would not adopt that. What would be apparent negative effect of this price mechanism? In certain cases, it could be very effective. Yeah. Think about smoking. Smokers very are very kind of inelastic to price changes. So that tax is eventually going to get passed to the to them, the smokers. Okay. So the effect of it wouldn't necessarily be accomplishing by decreasing smoking. That's a very good answer. And uh, that's a remarkably good answer. Because what you are you know, suggesting is that 
this kind of price mechanism could be completely ineffective in altering the amount of pollution that is being done because of the nature of the activities. The smoking example is a good example. Uh, if you think about, but smoking is not the largest cause of air pollution, industrial production is. So if we change the discussion from individual to much larger scale of pollution and try to argue uh, and try to recommend this tax subsidy kind of mechanism, how and why do you think they will be ineffective? So I've just expanded the, uh, you know, the argument. Sorry. To Senko's point, like, um, if you tax, for example, like the companies that are responsible for the largest amount of pollution, more than likely they're going to pass on that tax in some form in their pricing. So in reality, we would still be paying for that. You're not really hurting the company. Or... Is this true? What you just, what she just said and was sort of like supported by another argument, is this true? Do we see that in our real world? When I worked for Frito-Lay, they, they took advantage of the uh, government subsidizing um, vehicles, or I guess in their case, the company fleet. So they were all running off of liquid propane gas. And they were taking, they were investing large amounts of capital in order to take advantage of that subsidy. So to your point, I think in some cases, the tax will be passed on to the consumer. But if one company is doing that, another chip company, and Frito-Lay is taking advantage of this subsidized, um, they're going to be able to price lower and beat the competitor. So yes and no. I would say. So you are, your example is an example of a positive externality, positive externality where they are receiving a subsidy to basically increase the production of that good. And that is basically similar to what they are also saying, but they are talking about a different kind of problem where the objective is to discourage the production of negative externality for which a tax is imposed. In your case, a subsidy is supposed to encourage the production and it does. But my question is, are these two views that taxes will reduce externality and subsidy will encourage externality? Possibly one. Well, so, to support, so I work for Pepsi, and in Philadelphia they've passed a beverage tax, right? So they charge on all sweet, any kind of sweetener, whether it's diet or real sugar, they charge uh, 1.5 cents per ounce. But their goal, or the way they pass it, is that it's charged to the distributor, so to Pepsi. Naturally, us and all of our competition have passed that directly on to the consumer. So if you were to go to Walmart on sale and buy a 12-pack of soda, it's like 7 or $8, or $8 on sale. Um, so like in real life, we've seen that happen, and it, I think, okay. across the country. Very good. Thank you very much. What I will do, I will take a... Uh, you know, sort of radical turn to a, you know, a different area of the economy where I will argue that similar kind of behavior is observed. So I am in the process of obtaining a <coughs> loan from a bank. And when you apply for a loan after the 2009 financial crisis, according to Dot Frank, uh, you know, provision, you have to go through a large volume of documentation before the bank can offer you a loan and before you can basically receive a loan. When you, first of all, there is a direct cost associated with this documentation process. There is a time, constant cost involved, and you also pay a fee, by the way, and the fee has gone up. The fee a bank charges in terms of how much money they used to charge before to process your loan information has gone up, right? That is an equivalent example of how negative external, uh, government regulations <coughs> to prevent externality uh, really does not discourage those activities. It basically uh, you know, creates further loss to the side that the government was trying to protect. Now, are we all clear on that? This doesn't make sense. To me, the tax is in place for that reason, to pass it along to the consumer. Because, and there's no protection because the consumer is asking for it. Take oh, okay. ocean, take, uh, I'm not sure what what the... It's weight on the sugar. On the sugar? Yeah. Well, but, that's, that's, that's but if society is saying, hey, we want this, 
there's a cost, and they're putting the cost in the market and they're paying for it. Okay, uh, that's also a very relevant question. So his question is a different question. He's saying that, well, uh, the reason why the government is taxing is because people want better quality of care. They want better food standard. They want less fraudulent behavior in the financial market. So why are we saying that this is something bad for the economy? I'll more, that's a very good question. So what we will do towards the half, second half of the discussion about externality, we will move to the other side of this debate. But right? yes, please. What about a tax that's really a positive externality? Uh, you could do that too. Such that's as a school tax. Okay. So we pass a bond or school tax Very good. so and that we can raise funds to build or remodel or expand our schools. Please understand that but the tax that you're talking about is not taxing the activity. It is collecting the revenue that is going to finance that activity. Okay. And it is a very important aspect of this debate as well okay. when we talk about public goods. And okay. education is a public good. Okay. Um, this is a very important discussion. Now, um, since I'm running out of time, I will not discuss how the subsidy sometimes could backfire where you provide subsidy, and, and I think the classic example of a government subsidy that was trying to generate more positive externality was during the 2000, and this is a famous one, the government, the uh, government <coughs> of 2009 provided huge subsidy to this firm that was supposed to come up with green technology. Do you remember? What was the name of the company? I'm, I'm getting old and I don't remember oh. stuff. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone is aware of uh, yeah. some pieces of that story. And that story is an ex classic example of how sometimes, you know, subsidy to encourage positive externality does not really work. Okay, um, although we started the discussion by talking about taxes and subsidies, ways that price mechanism could really uh, find the optimum level of externality, this is not the most common mechanism through which these activities are controlled. The most common uh, forms of government control is in the quantity. Okay? Is it the quantity? <coughs> and this is much more, this makes much more sense because these are much more direct. Uh, you just limit the quantity of externality that can be created. How do you do that? By providing a variety of different and a mechanism. One is the quota system. Quota system is a very, very straightforward quantity based restriction on how much externality can be created. Right? Uh, for example, uh, you could have a rule that uh, gives a maximum amount of air that a certain firm can produce, uh, can pollute. End of the story. You could have uh, a quota that limits the maximum number of natural fish that you can you know, that, that you can harvest from the sea. That would be a quota that would be to prevent over harvesting, which is obviously an externality. So we understand the quota, how it restricts negative externality. How can quota be applied to positive externality? You can limit the maximum benefit that you would get. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so, so notice that. So notice that you are trying to encourage people to buy more or do more of these activities. So what do you do? How do you encourage that? Affirmative. Be more specific. That's a very interesting answer. I mean, this has been a really good learning experience for me. You know, I usually teach. Uh, much younger population, and I don't really get this kind of, you know, diametrically different answers. They're very fascinating. So, what, what do you mean? <coughs> well, I think one of the original ideas was if you hire more women, you hire more African American people, more people who are not classic white males in the United States. And they're very much right. Thinking was yeah. we all learn to get along better and continue. To yeah. So you force people to participate. Simple as that. And that's uh, basically the objective behind that is to generate this positive externality, right? Uh, in many countries around the world, uh, education is mandatory. What does that mean? It is forced. How do government force people to uh, send their kids to school? Think about it. 
penalties. Yeah, simple as that. <clears throat> Sometimes those penalties are, you know, forced penalties, like they are government mandated, or sometimes they're voluntary. Like if you send your kids to school, government is going to give you some grade, which is done in my country, right? I have a question. So if we're saying that externalities lead to inefficiencies in the marketplace, even if it's a positive <coughs> why would we want to encourage that behavior? Wouldn't that only further create inefficiencies? It would, but that? do we really care about if it, in efficiency or inefficiency when you are looking at these more serious issues, right? You're right that any kind of externality will create some form of social inefficiency. Who cares about that anyway? I mean, these are things that affect our life on a regular basis, right? We die or leave if the air pollution is not controlled, right? So uh, from a theoretical perspective, you know, uh, your argument makes sense, but I think what the reason why externality is such an interesting and hotly debated topic is the kind of effect it, it has on our lives. Let's take a break. When we come back, we will look at uh, two different approaches of looking at externality, and then finally we look at public goods. Very fascinating discussion. Let's come back after 10 minutes. <laughs>
on pen and paper they looked very efficient mechanisms right you know you are uh, you know restricting the number of uh, fishermen who could fish and also the amount of fish that they can fish none of them are without any controversy or limitation so let's look at how these basically turn out so this is basically back in the early 80s where you know there was a massive massive concern about the salmon in that particular river by the way okay and government decided that they are going to limit the number of vehicles that could uh, you know fish on that particular river so the le led to a major revolution in the fishing boats let's try to understand that so when i was young most of the fishing boats, so I am from a coastal part of my country. So when I was young, that's like, you know, 35 years ago. Uh, most of the boats were mainly designed to catch fish and take the fish to the shore. Simple as that. So fishermen go with their boat, they come with fish, and then they process the fish inland, right? Now, most of the fishing boat that goes to the sea and catch fish they have all sorts of facilities. By the time that fish comes to the shore, it is basically ready to be exported. And that's a massive change, massive technological change. Is it good? Well, it's good as long as the fish is there. If the fish dries out, these all this capital are completely useless. Right? Unless you convert that into a floating restaurant, which a lot of these ships are converted to. Right? It's not a joke, by the way. It's a serious issue. So in many parts of the world where rivers have dried out, massive investment that was made to basically facilitate fishing are now used for you know, tourism and other purposes. But the limitation, the scope is limited, right? Uh, Nile is basically drying up. <coughs> the river Nile, which is one of the largest rivers that starts from the mid-African countries and runs through at least 20 countries that we know, there are parts of Nile that is drying up and it has it is having a massive impact on the economy. So that's the LE. Now let's look at the TSE. So uh, the government basically said that at a given season, there is a maximum number of fish that can be caught, right? You can see from the onset, this kind of policy has fundamental flaws. Because if you impose the number of fish that fishermen can catch, they will always cheat. Right? They will hide those fish somewhere that you cannot see. None of these are made up stories. These are realistic stories where there has been reports where um, uh, a fishing boat actually has an entire compartment beneath them where they store the fish, which uh, you know, authorities cannot go to. But then there are some more direct effect of these kind of policies. Uh, the TSC, the maximum allowance, allow, allowable catch, basically gave rise to the deadliest catch episodes. Right? <coughs> I'm sure some of you have watched that. That's one of my favorite TV shows. Not because I like fishing, uh, but because of the intensity in which the fishing process is pursued, right? They have, they, they are, there is intense competition, right? There are only minimum number of days that you can catch fish, right? For the uh, king crab, I think the number of days that you can catch king crab in Alaska is like five days or seven days. And you can see that this is bound to lead to accidents because everyone is going to become reckless. So by trying to solve one problem, we are basically creating a whole host of other ones. Right? Makes sense. So the quota system, uh, although you know widely you know applied in various sectors, and we will talk about that, uh, is not that really effective. And so was the price mechanism. So the question is, what else can we do? What other ways can we try to have a realistic solution to the externality problem? <coughs> Uh, the third approach that economists have basically adopted is, is, is basically a combination of price and quantity. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dual composition. So, and this is, this is something that should be very much familiar to all of you. This is called tradable farming market. 
where you give or sell permits that allow firms to pollute. Right? So if you're a firm that has uh, that is bound to pollute the air more, like a steel industry or the dye, uh, you know, RNG industry or uh, color producing industry that has tremendous effect on the, you know, weather and environment, you buy more of these permits. Right? Simple solution. You can also sell these permits, by the way. If you don't need them, you can sell it to someone else who is going to pay a higher price if, if that particular production requires more right to pollute, right? And I'm sure we all know that this is not only a domestic farm to farm case, this is an international issue, right? So China is one of the largest buyers of these permits because the WTO has an international authority that can limit how much emissions that each of these countries can go through, right? So uh, China regularly buys some of these permits from other more environmental friendly countries, let's say Sweden and Finland and you know, right? So there's an international market there as well. Now what we see is that this has much, much more uh, prospect in the sense that because of this mechanism, which is basically a market mechanism, <coughs> not only is it going to change the price of pollution because of the law of demand and supply, it is also going to change the quantity. So by by having this kind of tradable permit market, you can change both the price and the quantity of pollution. That makes sense? And this is very popular, very popular. Uh, now, <clears throat> the debate where this particular mechanism is subject to is a fundamentally different one. Okay, and, and so we, we understand that a credible permit sounds like a good idea and it, it can control pollution, it can control the activities that, few, that, that people are going to uh, be undertaking. So this makes all sense, but then there are some fundamental questions. Um, one question is that uh, who is going to issue this? <coughs> That's the Alaska says government. I mean, most of the times, most of the times, as you will see, that it might, it don't have to be. Um, how would the government distribute those? Uh, are you going to just simply sell those uh, trading permit in the market? If you do that, then uh, if you have a very large air polluter, he's going to come and muscle out everyone and buy all of them and go home, right, and start polluting the air any possible way. Now that is a problem, right? Because by doing that, you are basically destroying other businesses because without polluting, they cannot produce anything. You see the problem? This has fundamental lags, and this is the argument that China is making against these regulations. China is arguing that, you know, in the early 1800, USA was the largest polluter of the world, and nobody had any kind of environmental regulation. USA could pollute air as much as it could and nobody would complain. Now, 100 years later, when China is in the same stage of economic development that USA was 100 years ago, why is China being subject to this tax? It's a tax, by the way, in some sense, right? So, uh, you know, the debate goes off and on and, you know, it's, it's an interesting argument, okay? So, a couple of questions. And we are going to explore each of them. So, uh, do the government need to be part of this assignment process, this designing process, either tax or subsidy <coughs> or political permit permits? It seems like there are no alternative to the government. And this is something that a lot of people fundamentally is fixed. Why do I, why 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 do I need to you know rely on government? Why would government limit how many uh, you know, deer I'm going to hunt, right? Do you see that? And you might think that these are, uh, you know, simple ideas or these are, uh, you know, views that are, you know, you know, held by few people, you are wrong. This is a very serious issue. So we started with PQVM tax, came from a French economist, came from the progressive 
to, you know, sort of mainstream idea of how government plays a proactive role in creating and protecting the environment, we now take a fundamentally different position. This time, this is coming from a Harvard lawyer in the 1970s. Pigou was in the 60s, 50s, 70s, Harvard lawyer, you know, John Coase, uh, was not an economist, suddenly came up with an idea. Uh, wrote a paper, published in Law Journal of Economics. Uh, he argued uh, he proposed a fundamentally different way of handling this problem. He argued that, well, you know, uh, if you are thinking about a um, solution to this, you really don't need any kind of government intervention. It's, it is unnecessary. Why? Because we know who is being affected by the uh, externality and who is benefiting from the externality. As long as these, these sides come together, they will always find a solution, right? So who is going to benefit from the externality is going to pay the group who is being affected and vice versa, and they are going to find a solution. So his argument, his argument is divided into two parts. Together they are called Coase Theorem, written in a seven page paper for which he got a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Prize. He never wrote a single paper after this, <laughs> right? Because I thought he got scared that, you know, why? Uh, and, and the reason, and, it, why, yeah, and you should think how this basically became one of the talking points of the conservative side of this debate. <coughs> so 1970s, you have the Nixon era. These issues are slowly becoming an issue. And suddenly you have a Harvard professor who is talking about a limited role of government, right? There is a there is a aligning of stars there, right? I, and I think he realized that, you know. Please bear in mind that what we are talking about here are remarkably important, remarkably important, because whether we like it or not, most of the current debate about a lot of these external effects either come from the Piguvian channel or come from the course view. Course view. So we need to be aware of that. So this is just one part of the Coase theorem, where the Coase theorem argues that, hey, you don't need anyone, you don't need government, you know, people can just come together within the context of a market and they can solve their own problem. That is not what makes Coase so important, because a lot of other people have talked about it, you know, earlier as well. Adam Smith had that invisible hand argument, right, which is basically what Coase is saying. But Coase made another argument, which is remarkable. He said that when you think about these <coughs> issues, right, let's imagine uh, natural resources like fish in a pond. Um, it doesn't really matter who owns the pond, as long as people who are trying to overfish and people who are trying to protect those fish, as long as they can meet with each other, they can always find a solution. You don't need government quota, you don't need taxes, these are all unnecessary. Well, people are happy with that. What made Coase so famous, he argued that pro property ownership does not matter in solving these problems. In a minute, in about 10 minutes, I will argue as to how remarkable this argument was and how misleading this argument was and by talking about a third group of Nobel laureates. Now, you know, so are we, call, are we clear on the main argument of the course? You don't need government intervention. And private ownership and the nature of the ownership doesn't really matter. Now we, we can ask, start the criticism of the second argument from the outset. We can argue that well, ownership does matter. If the owner of the resource is powerful, he can prevent people from abusing those resources. So overexploitation can be easily stopped. On the other hand, if the overexploitation group are much more powerful, right? <coughs> like the farm that is trying to uh, pollute the environment or like Voxogon. What did I bring the Voxogon argument? Any, any recent knowledge about Voxogon and how they are involved in these topics that we are talking about right now? Does anyone know? Voxogon is now the number one automobile maker in the world. And um, in some of their models, they ha actually have uh, installed a machine, a uh, sort of device 
that basically gives you know misleading report of how much <coughs> you know uh, smoke the machine engine emits. Why is that important? Because uh, if you emit too much gas, you are basically not efficiently burning your fuel. That means your machine is not fuel efficient, right? That's what they were arguing after, right? So what they did, they tweak all those numbers by basically installing a defective device which gave better rating for the machine efficiency and indirectly were reporting less gas emission. You see that? They are paying billions of dollars of fine. And that's one of the problem of the quantity restrictions or whatever kind of mechanism we can think about because you know, both sides of the market will cheat. They will not adhere to the rules. So you need to, and you can see where Kos is coming from, right? This is, and, and his legal background is playing an important role. He recognizes that just by devising policy, you really cannot solve these problems. You need to have some more fundamental mechanism. Although the mechanism he suggested makes sense, makes sense at that time, over time we understood that they are, they are wrong. Okay, uh, he made several assumptions. First of all, he assumed that people can costlessly meet with each other, right? People who are causing the actions, people who are being hurt by the actions, they can literally meet and they can negotiate. Um, that's obviously not true. You know, we just gave an example of a river, right? Um, we should extend that idea a little bit. So let's think about, let's say we are thinking about and I want to start this because I'm going to come back to this several times. So let's think about social security. So you are thinking about increasing the benefits of the social security or reducing tax on social security. Uh, obviously you are benefiting the current older age population. But you are imposing a cost to the future generations for which they cannot come and bargain with you because they are not alive yet. Right? When you think about the cost of air pollution or cost of overfishing, the cost is not only being borne by the current generation, they are also going to be borne by future generation who are not even born. So they are basically not part in, they are not in the bargaining table that goes is suggesting. Make sense? And that's a very, very big problem. Now one of the students in the other section made a remarkable statement, and I really like that, and that's why this has been an enriching experience for me, is that why do we think that the future generations actually care, or will care? Right? That's a valid question, right? There is <coughs> billions of dollar, billions of dollars that is being invested to keep wild tigers in nature, so that there is a you know uh, you know a wild tiger population protection program across the world, right? The the fear is that if all the tigers, wild tigers, are killed, we will only see tigers in the zoo, and our future generation will not like it. I mean, is that true? It might that my, my grandchildren might not even care that there are no tigers in the forest. Make sense? So there are always counter argument to everything. Okay, so coming back to the Coase theorem argument, uh, it is obviously true that they, uh, it takes time for people to coordinate. Something, sometimes they cannot even come to the coordination table because they simply are not born. Or also notice that people who die, pay social security tax and die early, they are also a victim of this mechanism that they cannot be part of the debate, part of the bargaining when the bargaining matters. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so. On the theoretical level, Coase theorem makes a very strong, uh, you know, uh, implication as how we can solve some of the externality problem. Uh, he made argument that government is not important. He made argument that ownership is not important. Obviously, nobody paid attention to him, right? Uh, if you tell the government, "Hey, back off! We are going to solve all our problems," government is not going to do that. Why? Because these problems also involve a lot of money, right? The environmental 
The anti-environmental lobby groups spend billions of dollars in a given year. So the government is not simply going to back away from that because they are going to lose this huge source of revenue that they can earn from these lobby groups. You see the point? Because government has you know, dual, you know, dual interest. The government wants to protect the people who are affected, but government also wants to also get benefit from the people who are affecting those people. So it's a, it's a, not, it's a non trivial process. Now let us finally ask the you know the bold lighted question, the set of questions. It's not one a multitude of questions. Okay, so let's believe. So by the uh, let's, let's go one step back. Government uh, obviously did not back back away, uh, just like Coast said. What the government did, they and Coast was part of this policy making institution. By uh, this was the Republican era in the 1970s, 75. 78. I think he was even part of the uh, Jimmy Carter administration. And uh, where government was regularly talking about this, how to design regulations that can <coughs> capture the coast view. This is how important this guy was. He, he, this, was a, this guy was a philosophical guru for the policy makers, right? Okay, so now let's raise a set of questions. So, uh, how should a regulatory agency distribute these rights? Uh, should the rights be given away or allocated by sectors? Uh, you know, how do you want to auction that and let the highest bidder buy that? But these are not the questions that I am interested in. I am interested in a much more fundamental question. How do you limit the level of pollution? How do you limit the amount of overfishing? How do you limit the, uh, the kind of negative economic activity on the economy? What do you make those decisions based on? Are, are we clear on the question? Okay, yeah, that's it. And I, I think it requires a certain bit of clarification. So, the, so, the, so let's say the government uh, declares that, well, the number of, uh, you know, um, the amount of fish in the uh, British Columbia River, river is too low. So it requires protection. How is the government making that statement? What is too low? What is too high? What is this based on? Or some kind of threshold. There's a threshold out there, right? So it was. It used to be like that. Now it is like that. So it's a It's a. It's a comparative argument. consumption rates number of schools. If you can track schools, but I'd be more concerned about the consumption rate and knowing how much they need against what's been traditionally. Well, the, the idea, the, 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 the discussion about threshold is embedded in your word traditional. So traditional means that you are comparing a, sort of like a standard scenario, you are calling that traditional and then if there are spikes in the consumption, you are calling it too much. So there is a threshold always there when you are making this kind of statement. I want to take a break from that and I want to tell you a story. So the previous university that I used to teach in, uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, who was a full-time faculty member in the Department of Management, was a full-fledged climate change, you know, <coughs> dinner. So and she and I used to have dinner in you know, a lunch every day because we, you know, we used to have we used to have office uh, side by side. And every day she used to give me fascinating new, you know, empirical evidence as to why this global warming is a hoax. So, you have, so these are not like random people in internet. These are like real, real, serious people, right? One of the arguments that she used to make, and this is very important, is that most of these global warming argument is based on data from the 1960s and 70s, basically 1960s. And 1960s was an exceptionally cold decade. So anytime you are taking 1960s as a baseline, 
and you are measuring the increase in temperature since then, obviously the numbers are spiking up because the threshold was very low. Don't researchers look at the ge geological... I mean, uh, yeah, you are just talking very serious. <laughs> so, because, so you're right. I mean, uh, this is, this is, so I'm not having this conversation with a scientist, right? I'm having a conversation with a person who can actually have a important impact on policy. Okay? And that's how the argument goes. And if you ignore the scientific uh, evidence, by the way, there are no scientists in the policy making institutions. So there is this guy, Neil Gracie, or whatever the last name is, I cannot pronounce that. Right? He made a very strong argument in one of the TV shows that whenever you look at the uh, host of senators and state representatives, almost all of them are lawyers. None of them, not a single person in that very large body of policymakers are scientists. Doctors are not scientists. They are practitioners. You know, they, uh, you know, they have been given a set of scientific tools and ideas which they implement. Right? Is there, and there is a difference, right? So, you know, if you are a doctor and you are a senator, you really cannot, you know, argue that I'm a scientist, I know everything, which a lot of people do. Okay, so that's basically a huge problem, right? Because when you, when you start making argument about, do you see where we started talking about Coase theorem and we directly jumped to environmental problem, right? This is how remarkable this idea is applicable to so many different places. Right? Another problem is that how are you going to sort of implement that? You know, who are you going to give these uh, you know, license or whatever trade partners to? People are going to cheat anyway, right? And we already you know, addressed that. Okay. Uh, so that basically is so the objective of this, this discussion is not to really give you a complete discussion and understanding about externality. It cannot be done because most of the questions related to externality are still unanswered. It's an ongoing debate. So I'm going to switch uh, to the last part of this chapter because I'm running out of time. I need to you know, open up at least one, one hour for the last part of the discussion. Um, it's public goods. Public goods. Public goods are goods that uh, government or some is, is provided and you know basically everyone uses that word. And that's a very simple definition. I don't want to go into too much into complications. When we think about public goods, we think about natural highway, you know, national highways, we think about a national park, we think about fireworks. Fireworks. Today we'll talk about fireworks. Okay, um, when you look at public goods, there are two things that are inherent in a public good. Again, I want to take one step back. A public good basically is an example of a positive externality. Because when you, when you drive your car through a national highway and you don't really pay taxes to anyone, that good, you are basically enjoying the benefit but you are not paying for that. Do we all say that? We'll That's not paying through taxes, right? It's we'll come back to that. That's a good point. It's not very good point. And, um, and you can, and you should see that this is inherently embedded in our discussion that we already have so far. So give me a couple of minutes, I will address your question. It's an important question. Uh, for the time being, uh, uh, you, you know, most of the times, by the way, unless it's not a national highway, which is federal government funded, most of the state highways are paid by the state. So if you are from Virginia and you are going to California, the highway that you are going to be using when you are driving through Arkansas, you are not paying anything for that. Right? Because that road was built with the taxes paid by Arkansas residents. Unless you have a toll for toll road. Right? Where you have to be pay, pay tax. There are two things that make uh, discussion of public goods interesting and different from the discussion of private goods. We all understand what private good is. Uh, these are goods that you and I buy from Walmart. 
Anytime we buy a good from Walmart, we immediately do two things that we don't, we are not aware of. First thing is that we buy an exclusive ownership of that good. If I buy a land or a car, I have the exclusive ownership of driving that car or owning that piece of land, right? Make sense? So, any private good is a rival good. If I use that good, you cannot use it, right? Public goods are non-rival because if you are watching the you know fireworks in Disneyland and somebody else is sitting next to you, that person is also you know enjoying the same thing. So you by enjoying the firework view is not preventing the second person from enjoying the same view. So it's the non-rival product. The first argument is that uh, characteristics of public good is that it is non-excludable, meaning that it is basically meant for everyone. So again, uh, it makes sense, you know, the fireworks or the national highway are examples of non-excludability. Okay, they are, they are kind of interesting. Um, let's try to understand now a little bit more about how goods that generate positive externality, such as the public good, can lead to social inefficiency. The cause of social inefficiency in terms of a public good is the same reason why goods that generate positive externality also are inefficient. Let's explain that. Let's say in this economy there are two guys, two people. And person number one wants to consume the public good in this way. So if you allow this person to determine how much goods need to be produced, the person would say this amount, right? This is where his marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost and he's gonna say, I want this amount of good being produced. Now, if you are, if you ask the second person, hey, how much of this good we need to produce? He's going to say, I want Q2 and I want no more. I don't care about anything else, anyone else, right? The problem here is that this is a public good. That means it is a non-excludable. You have to basically provide that good to everyone. So th that can only be achieved if you add up the individual benefit and produce uh, the amount of this public good up to Q star power. And that is the efficient level of public goods, which allows everyone to consume and create a non-rival environment where everyone, uh, no one can exclude other person from enjoying that. If you look at this, you notice something fundamental about public goods. Almost always, this good has to be provided by the government or some kind of regulatory agency. Do we all see that? Because person one would not be willing to produce the socially efficient level. Person two would not be willing to provide the social efficiency level. So if these goods are being provided by the private sector, the amount of good will always be less than social efficiency level. Right? Tell that to our education secretary. Right? It will always be less than what? It will be inefficient, right? It will either be Q1 or Q2, or whoever is uh, entrusted to producing that good, right? Unless it's a, it's a regulatory agency. Like a government. So what about like in California, like in San Jose, where Facebook's going to sponsor like free wireless internet for the whole city? That's probably marketing, right? That's probably marketing, and uh, marketing is a complicated concept. Uh, so you are, so you think that uh, uh, Facebook providing Wi-Fi services to a very large city serves the purpose of a public good because nobody is excluded from using that good. First of all, that's not true because bandwidth is get, uh, gets hammered by how many people use that. So anytime I use internet, I affect how much internet you use. But you, but you have some truth in your argument. And it's a very interesting question, right? Can the private sector provide the socially efficient level of public good? Many of you will say yes, they can, right? Otherwise, all these debates about charter schools or magnet schools would not happen, right? Yeah. Don't we do that through government, in a way? Please, yeah. please, please explain that. I like your... So, I mean, we, we are the government. We 
we pay the taxes that support all the things that are public. I mean, we do that through the government. So I, I wouldn't see why some public, <coughs> some non-government agency could provide this. Maybe, I see what you're saying, though. It'd be a lot harder. But, I mean, what about different governments, different states, different, the federal versus the state? Well, there's still some kind of <laughs> regulatory agency that are neither person <coughs> one nor person two, right? Let me, uh, you know, uh, answer your question in a broadest possible way, right? You are right that any uh, entity or organization can provide that Q star power. As long as that organization is neither Q1 nor Q2, right? That's a very, very politically motivated answer. Think about it. We don't have time to go over the politics of that. Um, so, uh, again, so that's basically the socially efficient level of public goods. How do you ensure that? How do you ensure that Q star uh, level of public goods are going to be produced? Um, we just covered that, so optimal level of public good. Um, when we talk about optimal level of public good, uh, it raises another issue that we have to discuss in this same context, <coughs> which is called a free rider problem. Free rider problem refers to a problem when you enjoy a certain good, but you do not pay for that. Now, you can see clearly that most of the public goods by design have free rider problem. Because we just talked about this highway that you drive through and you don't pay any full tax, uh, you are basically a free rider. Right? So why are we talking about free rider anyway? Because we, since we know that public goods inherently have the free rider problem, there is a reason for that. The reason why we are talking about free rider problem is not in the context of education or other goods that provide positive externality. The reason why we talk about free rider problem is because it can intensify the level of negative externality in our economy. So again, I'm going to take a, another very uh, dramatic change to the other side of the debate, and I will talk about tragedy of the commons. Okay, let's fix the philosophical thought process that has governed this debate about externality and how to solve the externality problem. We can go back 300 years ago, start with Adam Smith, where nothing, uh, you know, nothing is unsolvable, everything is solved through the market mechanism. Then we can talk about Pigus, who argued that you know, you know, market mechanisms cannot solve anything. We need to have very strong government hand, taxes and subsidies. Then we move to Coase, who said again, goes back to the original argument that, well, you know, we don't need anyone. As long as people are happy, self-interested, self-motivated to, you know, come together and solve the problem, we are done, right? So the third group of economists, again, ironically from Harvard, in the 1990s, identified another fundamental flaw of the Coase theorem. They never mentioned Coase theorem in almost half of the paper that they wrote. Three economists working together, Nobel <coughs> uh, Let me tell you the story of the paper. So it's a story. Imagine that you have a grazing field in the middle of three villages, village A, B, and C. And in that grazing field, everyone comes and graze their animals. Simple, very uh, realistic possibility, right? Now imagine that nobody really owns the grazing field. There is no property ownership. So it's a common resource. What would happen? What would happen when no one owns the grazing field? It would get overgrazed. Absolutely. Simple story, very important implication. Because everyone will come to the field and say, and will say that, well, since I don't own this particular property, why should I care? 
I will graze my animals and leave. The second person will come and do the same thing. And there will be overproduction or overgrazing. Right? This is a not, this cannot be a simple story that could earn a Nobel Prize, but it did. Why? Because the authors <coughs> then made a suggestion, a policy recommendation, an idea how the problem can be solved. They say that the simplest way to solve this problem is just to give ownership to one of these villages. Just give one of them. So what will happen is that if one village has property rights to that particular piece of grazing land, they will start charging people for you know a fee for the use of that land, and it automatically solves the externality problem. If you don't do that, you have tragedy of the commons. It will be over overgrazed, uh, and it will go to a point where these resources cannot be recovered. Any question? How do you decide which one? Very good. How do you do that? How do you decide? How? So if at the end of this discussion you are asked this fundamental, I'm, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm done. I'm, 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 I will I will uh, close this. So that we have covered all this, so it's not. So I'm, I'm going to scroll this and I'm going to raise the question that I, I, I sincerely want you to think, not for the exam, but for your <coughs> own enrichment. So, so we have public goods, right? This could be, uh, you know, arts and crafts. This could be, uh, you know, PBS. This could be NPR. This could be endowment for arts. This could be a lot of things. These are all public goods, by the way. Because if NPR, uh, you know, uh, you know, creates programs that benefits everyone, it's a public good. How do you ensure that the efficient level of public good is provided? Do you take the public approach? Do you take the private approach to provide public goods? What's the solution? When you think about this question, and you will be encountering this question in the next set of years, because that's how this debate about public goods are evolving, you are going to be faced with a set of, set of questions. So question number one is that, let's say you make a decision about to produce public goods. That decision has been taken. But how do you determine what level of public goods you are supposed to provide? Is it OK to have only one TV channel in a country? That should be sufficient because you can get almost all your news but from a single TV channel. Are we all clear on where I am going? None of these debates are ir ir irrelevant, right? Turkey, in the last 10 years, have reduced the size of their you know, network, the TV media, from, uh, I think, 40 different TV ch stations to five. Russia has one, right? So if a government makes an argument that, hey, one TV channel is sufficient, all you need to uh, do is just see me on TV every day, and you should be happy, right? Can you make an argument against that? Do you see the point? Another problem is that when we have already talked about the spatial problem in solving these issues, right? A river that runs thousands of miles, everyone is being affected on that river if there is a single form polluting the air, the water. So how do you distribute the cost of that external effect and how do you charge those for those costs? Right? Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen Eric Brokovich, that's the, that's the name of the movie, right? Yeah. It's actually based on a true story. Right? I uh, read an article um, on this particular city in Virginia through which there is a national electricity grid and the and a cancer rate in that particular city is 2300% higher than national average. Every household in that particular city has either a cancer patient or somebody has died. They sued the government. They got you know, millions of dollars, but it took a long time. It needed scientists to show that, yes, this had an external effect, right? Right?
Now, the final question, and this is all for your thinking, right? So, uh, let's say you know that there is going to be a problem for the future. So, we talked about the spatial problem with, uh, with externality. We talked about the regulatory structure. The final question, what if the problem is a time dimensional? What if you are doing something today that has a negative effect or positive effect on future generations? How do you how do you resolve this? How do you resolve that? Do you reduce uh, the social security benefits for the older population today so that the younger population in the future have a smaller debt burden? Do you borrow more today so that you can provide infrastructures to the current generation uh, at the cost of the future generation who will be paying a higher tax to finance <coughs> the debt that you are accumulating? How do you? How, how are you going to balance that? Now, uh, you know, political, you know, so there are some important issues that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the fact that any time you are asking for uh, current generations to cut their benefits so that they can, it can benefit the future generations, it is never going to fly. Why? But I don't think it's a zero sum <coughs> game. I don't think that in the real world it's necessarily we have to completely lose for the future to gain. I feel like. Oh no, no. Who is saying that you're going to create synergies? And I feel like I'll, to answer the question you've been asking is. It's regulation, you know, the whole, if we want to get into the, the government budget, you know, if we didn't have extraneous, somewhat unnecessary spending, if we didn't take from Social Security to begin with, we wouldn't have to worry about refunding it to have money there for the future generations. I mean, I think that, um, well, good governance, good governance is a key, key ingredient, there is no, no doubt about that, but is good governance sufficient? Are we justified to put all the blame to the government, to the policy makers? The answer is no. Think about it. When you think about asking the current generations to make some kind of sacrifice for future generations, why would they care? Because current generations vote. When the policies are being undertaken, the people who are who have the ability to vote are going to vote in their benefit, right? right. When social security was enacted in the 1930s, and you can you can read transcripts or read you know radio announced you know sort of uh, uh, lectures of FDR back then, he was making argument for <coughs> social security for two reasons. Two reasons. One is that we are going to protect our future generations. Notice how misleading that statement is, right? His argument was that we need to protect our future generations. We need to protect them so that they don't, you know, they have certain standard of living. We cannot let our generations go down like the one that happened during the Great Depression. That was, that was quite fascinating. And I, you know, it, it's very empowering when you look at how he's talking about the poor. The second argument is what why I like FDR, I am a big FDR fan, is that FDR is talking about social security as a moral argument. He's saying that it is our responsibility to provide for people who really cannot save. As you all know, that almost half of the recipients of social security uh, benefits are people who never paid a single dime of tax in their life. But you all know that, right? <coughs> So that leads to another dimensional discussion where you can argue that, well, I am working, I am paying tons of money for my tax, but this is pay as you go. Uh, so when a guy who has never paid a tax after 20 years uh, gets benefits based on what I pay taxes on, and that is not fair. Do you see the point? Do you see the point? Now that's where the fear argument about moral obligation is such an important issue. Is that at the end of the day, we can talk about economics, you know, for so long, but some of the policies are based on our ethnic, ethical understanding about issues, right? 
there is a moral argument there because social security, when it was first enacted by a German emperor, was based on a very simple idea. It was <coughs> what he called a safety net. A safety net. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term. A safety net refers to programs in a society that basically protects the most vulnerable part of the society. And that could be, uh, you know, sort of like a nutritional program, that could be, uh, you know, unemployment benefit, and that could also be social security. So these debates are all ongoing debates. There are no right or wrong answers about them. There are only causes and consequences. Right? Thanks. Let's take a break, come back. Uh, at 4.10, uh, we, and, and we will probably take about half, half an hour to just go over some aspect of exam number four. Thank you. <laughs> okay, what do you notice about this picture? Just price and fuel. What do you notice about this picture? What is interesting about this picture? Just price and fuel. It doesn't tell you which day. It doesn't tell you what day. You got to tell me every day to see. Good. And it doesn't tell you exactly how much of the tax price is being cut. Right. So it doesn't really contain information about the exact price. It doesn't give you exact date at which these prices are going to be cut. The question is asking you what kind of price discrimination is this. Okay. So we talked about three different kinds of price discrimination. One is uh, what we call a first degree price discrimination where you know perfectly about you know, who is willing to buy how much and what price they are willing to pay and you charge those prices. Perfect price discrimination. Then we talked about a third degree price discrimination where you do not know everyone, but you at least know the different segment of the market. You know that the rich is going, the young is going to pay a different price versus the old and you charge different prices for them. Because you can see who is who. If you are, if, you, if this, if one guy is a, uh, you know, young guy, you charge a different price. If one is a uh, old guy, you charge a different price. But sometimes you don't know who is who. Right? If you don't know who is who, you have to resort to second degree price discrimination, which are all indirect <coughs> price discrimination. So you will uh, go to a variety of different ways you can adopt those. One of them is that you can charge uh, different prices on different parts of the week uh, and assume that people uh, will come to your gas station on different parts of the week depending on what kind of people they are. Right? What kind of demand they have. That's the clue for this question. Um, what about B? So, management training services provided to IBM and management training services provided to a small company. Uh, I cannot tell you the correct answer, and I am not going to comment on any of the answers. I want <laughs> you guys to. Uh, so my my job is to provide you with clues and uh, a little bit of clarity about what what is entailed in that question. What I can tell you is the first picture that I showed you is very pretty. Be very careful when you are analyzing that. Uh, just like your first take home exam. Uh, please do not be afraid that if your answer is wrong, you are going to get a zero. As long as you provide explanation, economic explanations for your answer, you will get points. If you remember the fair take question, uh, where I have written that uh, some of your comments or your choice of monetary policy <coughs> was not the correct one, but I gave you full points anyway because your argument was compelling. Right? So, so spend some time on that. So, the, the, so I, I'll provide two clues for B. One is that the service that is being provided to IBM versus 
this small company. Are these the same service or are there some kind of difference in these services? If they are the same service, which, uh, which is not obvious, so you, you will make your argument. What kind of price is being charged to these two different firms? That's point number one. Point number two, if the management services that are being provided to IBM, which could be very custom made versus a small firm, which could be very general, it could be very similar to Microsoft selling different versions of uh, work, you know, uh, you know, Windows system, operating system. Make sense? That would be something like what we call a versioning. So please think about them and make your answers. We will we will look at bundling in the in the context since I cannot comment on the actual problem I want to talk about bundling uh, in the context of what we covered in the class we talked about bundling <coughs> in a situation where you provide you bundle two goods or multiple multiple of them in one package provide them with a bundling price and that basically maximizes your revenue. There are two key, key, key ingredients in bundling. First of all, there has to be some kind of negative relationship between the two goods that we are buying. So let's start with a situation where this is violated. So if you if you look at this particular example, there are two person and they are the company is trying to sell them these two cable channels. Notice that Dakota, who is willing to pay more for ESPN from nine to ten is also willing to pay more from uh, Madison to buy the history channel. So she is willing to buy, uh, pay more for both of these channels. What I'm trying to say is that these are two different kinds of people. People with very different kind of elasticity. So charging them a bundling price really doesn't benefit the firm, which is basically confirmed in the, confirmed in the discussion. So please take a look at that. In the second one, although Dakota is willing to pay higher price for the first one, she is willing to pay lower price uh, or uh, lower price for the second channel. So the only way the company can uh, compel the second uh, second person or both of them to buy both channels is to offer a bundle price. And when they buy the bundle price, it basically increases the revenue of the firm. If you systematically look at this, the question in the final exam, exam number four should be easy. Okay. <coughs> this particular question uh, about the two boxers who are fighting with each other and are subject to two decision making process of whether to take or not take steroid can be analyzed when we look at uh, prisoner's dilemma in uh, game theory. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what the prisoner's dilemma was. So remember this was two people, convicted felons, they have com committed a crime together and the police is trying to force them to confess um, and they are being interrogated separately, and this is the payoff matrix. So if Bob confesses and Art confesses at the same time, both of them get three years and three years each. Uh, if Bob confesses and Art <laughs> denies, Bob gets a year, uh, you know, Art gets 10, 10 years. Right? Okay, so the question, the question in the final exam asks you two things. What is the Nash equilibrium here? So a Nash equilibrium is a equilibrium of strategies. It's, a, it's an equilibrium of strategies where your action is consistent with my actions or strategies and my strategies are consistent with your strategies. So both of the side has to be satisfied. Now let's start with the strategy where Bob denies. <coughs> if Bob denies, 
What should art do? Deny. You're very much right. Well, no, you're not right. Oh, yes. right. Yeah. Okay. Art so, yeah. <laughs> Carried away. <laughs> so, if Bob denies, the best thing that art could do is confess and get one year. Yeah. Right? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So, so Bob knows that if he denies, art is going to confess. Now, if art confesses, what should Bob do? Deny. Absolutely. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, Bob will also confess. I apologize. Right? Bob will confess, right? Because Bob can get three years as opposed to ten years. <coughs> so, to begin with, oh. if Bob denies, Art will confess. If Art confesses, Bob confesses. So, Bob conf uh, denying and Art confessing, they're not an equilibrium. Because when I do something, you do something else, and when you do that, I do something else. Your action and my action are not consistent with each other. Let's now think about a situation where Bob confesses. If Bob, or Bob confess, what does Art do? Yes. Art confesses too, right? Because three years is smaller, you know, uh, you know, jail time than ten, right? Now, what happens when Art confesses? So when Bob confesses, we see Art <coughs> will confess. What happens when Art confesses? What do Bob do? <laughs> they all, the Bob also confesses. This is a Nash equilibrium. When Bob confesses, Art confesses. When Art confesses, Bob also confesses. There is a symmetry in the strategy. But, but then is it deny, deny? Well, we just proved we just proved that if Bob denies, Bob denies, Art will confess, and if Art denies, Bob will do something else. Bob will basically, if Art denies, Bob will confess, right? <coughs> That's not an equilibrium, and that lies the second part of your exam question. We see that this is an equilibrium that really does not benefit them. If they had a pact before they were taken to the police by for interrogation, and they created a pact that look, you're gonna deny and I'm gonna deny. Right? If you deny and I deny, we both get lower sentences than what we otherwise would get. This cooperation really cannot work because, you know, yes, always there is one party that cheats out of that. Make sense? Question. The next, the next question is about this sequential behavior in the game market. Okay? So, Any question about this question? <coughs> this question about credibility. So the question is um, if milli mattress develops anti bug mattress and Philly mattress also develops an anti bug mattress, then this is what they get. So uh, the question is saying that Philly is is promising that if milli mattress develops you know, uh, anti-bug matrix, they are not going to develop anything like that. So they are committing that if you invent something, I am not going to invest money on that. Is this a credible strategy? Are they believable? Are we all clear on that? So this is a game of credibility where you threat your opponent <laughs> by saying something or committing some by committing something and your opponent has to figure out whether your threat or your promise is credible or not. This is an example of a promise. We will look at an example of a threat. Okay. So the three example of this uh, issue is that this is what the situation. So 
So we, uh, uh, Russia is thinking about either maintaining a status quo where they do nothing or they attack. And the USA is saying that if you attack us, we are either going to go to the convention, try to get an international coalition against you, or we are going to start a nuclear war. Right? So are we all clear on the options that these two countries have? So um, Russia is thinking that if I attack, US has two options, either to convention or, or go nuclear. And let's think about what, what US would do. By the way, US is, is threatening Russia. That if you attack me, I'm going to attack you back. We're going to have a nuclear war. Everything is going to fall apart, right? Now let's look at whether USA is going to actually do that, whether it's credible for USA to do that. In order to do that, we need to think about these two. And USA is the, so Russia is thinking, if I attack, what would USA do? So if Russia attacks and USA can either do this or that, the benefit is the second one. So by going to the convention, US, US gets minus one. By going to nuclear war, US leaves one, 100. So which one do you think USA would do? They will go to the convention. So regardless of how much time USA threatens Russia, that if you attack me, I will go to war with you, Russia knows that that threat is not credible. As a result, Russia will attack. Sounds like a doomsday kind of prediction. <coughs> Right. So, you simply cannot make a threat credible by just talking against your opponents, like what is being done against North Korea right now. Now, the debate between this example, by the way, this came from a movie in the 70s. This is a Kurosawa, very famous movie. I'm sure some of you have seen the movie. Okay, anyway. <laughs> this is, huh? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, why? So, why is this? Why is in this scenario uh, a nuclear warfare was likely, and why is that different in the North Korea case? Why is Doctor? Why is what happened in Doctor Strange look different than North Korea? Is that what yeah, you're asking? Yeah. Because the rockets can't reach here. You had a rogue guy. You had you had somebody who had kind of gone rogue who was in charge of the decision. Okay, um, but there are always crazies in these countries, right? There are always going to be crazy people or sane people pretending that they are crazy. Because craziness sells, by the way. Believe me, I have seen crazy policy policy policymakers. Um, so uh, is it the is it the you know the you know aggressive nature of the policymakers threatening to you know do something or is it are there something more fundamental? Let's look at the numbers. Let's look at numbers and try to get an idea. This is very interesting. The guy who looked at this issue for the first time is a Nobel laureate. His name is Robert Schiller. He teaches at Yale. <coughs> In, in the case of North Korea, it's not minus 100 minus 100. Very good, very good. Our right. power is not equal. This is where the debate is, right? In the 1970s, when this was debated, Russia and US had equal amount of nuclear power. So if there is a war, there is going to be an Armageddon like this, right? Everything will be wiped out. But if USA, if this is North Korea, and North Korea attacks, and if nuclear USA simply can drop an atom bomb that basically wipes out North Korea without invoking that much cost to them, let's say this is zero, then a threat is very much credible. Well, why are we so worried about North Korea? I don't know. That's a, that's a political question, right? It's an economics course. <laughs> could be minus one Tokyo. <laughs> okay. Same, same reason we're worried about crowds at the United 
has a value. <laughs> okay, uh, the last question. Any electoral college? Though? Any question about the game theory question so far? Okay, the last question that I will talk about is about. <coughs> uh, by the way, um, uh, obviously the co executive compensation is a fascinating question. Uh, for these questions, please go to the uh, you know article comments that many of your colleagues have written, and some of those articles uh, comments are remarkably good, remarkably good. So you have resources that you can use to basically answer your questions. Final question. Uh, you know, for the uh, uh, TPP five reasons, you know, you can do whatever you want. There are a lot of information available. I want to talk about vertical and horizontal integration. That will be our last topic. So we have very good understanding about what vertical integration is. Uh, vertical integration is when you have something like the one that you are looking at. Um, you know, uh, you are a plastic food industry. You are producing plastic to the final consumer. At the beginning of that process is a natural gas production that basically produces the first ingredient in that. So that's an example of a supply chain, and that's basically an example of a vertical integration. There are a lot of reasons why vertical integration is important. I think we talked about transfer price pricing a little bit. Uh, obviously, if you are uh, producing furniture and you have a lumber industry uh, in your, uh, you know, in your upstream uh, chain, it obviously saves you money, right? Rather than buying the intermediate raw materials from someone else, you are buying it from yourself. Make, make sense? Um, uh, information access is very important, right? If you have, if Walmart has a uh, information sharing mechanism with Tyson, where Tyson basically maintains the inventory of chicken inside Walmart, Walmart basically saves money by by you know giving Tyson a part of the supply chain. So, so the vertical integration is very much well understood. There is nothing really complicated about that. Um, so GM and Fisher auto body, they are obviously part of the vertical supply chain. <coughs> they are vertically integrated. Um, they are, they are, there can be a wide variety of different ways this kind of integration could occur, right? Um, where the, the place, so GM and Fisher auto body is an example of a vertical merger. Walmart and Tyson is an example of a vertical merger where you know, basically, Tyson has basically you know, are inside of Walmart in some sense, right? Because you know, horizontal merger is where things are interesting. Why do firms horizontally merge anyway? Let's start with the conglomerate mergers, and I just this is just for your understanding. So Sony and CBS they are merging together. What kind of merger is this? What kind of integration is that? Are we still talking about the horizontal, or are we talking about the conglomerate? Uh, in case of the conglomerate mergers, where Sony, which basically has an entire production line, and CBS, which also has an entire <coughs> vertically integrated system, when they merge together, what kind of merge is this? Horizontal. And it is also vertical, right? Because you have a sort of horizontal integration at every level, and you also have a vertically integrated system, right? And that's very important because Coke, what is the Coke example? Coke basically merged with a brewer, right? That's amazing, right? They, they don't have anything in common, right? But by merging together, they actually created a larger you know, supply chain. So it's a horizontal and vertical integration at the same time. The place where we get the most complicated part is the horizontal merger. <coughs> so what is a horizontal merger? It is AT&T and Bell South. How can, so what, what do firms gain in this kind of horizontal merger? Very good. But, but let's not stop there. Yes, it's market share. If you come up with uh, with a partner that produces very similar product, you become a larger brand and you can get a larger market share. That's not the only 
Please don't know why they do that. Could also uh, shared technology, like shared technology or information. Please explain. Spread, spread overhead costs across a bigger economy. Okay. Improve financial performance. Uh, one firm could basically give capital uh, sort of you know inflow to another firm, and that could have a, there could have a financial benefit, right? I want to come back to your information argument in a minute. That is very relevant for your exam. Right? Okay. So the question in the exam is about Intel and Microsoft. Obviously, they are vertically integrated. I don't need to explain to you. Uh, how Intel is on the upstream of that you know, supply <coughs> chain, right? Uh, we can get, we can make a very, uh, you know, constructive statement about how the vertical integration occurs. The question is on the second part, which asks you how Tyson, uh, um, uh, Microsoft and Intel be horizontally integrated. I cannot tell you really answer to that question. But I can talk about Tyson and Walmart and how they can also share a horizontal integration. Let's explain. How are Tyson and Walmart horizontally integrated? Distribution channels? Very good. Please, speci please specify. Very, very good. <laughs> now, you have to articulate that, either way or I will grade your exam based on what you have written, not what I think you know, right? So how is that? How, how do this share uh, horizontal uh, integration? I mean, both of them are um, distribution channels. And how do both of them benefit when they are horizontally merged? Well, I mean, you can look at it in terms of fleet capacity, distribution networks. Tyson have distribution centers that we could Walmart would then take advantage of that they wouldn't have to pay for because the building distribution center is costly. Um, I mean, there, there are many benefits, costs to that. Okay. Now, <coughs> sure. yes. are we talking about legally merged, or we're talking about we have a business partnership? between Tyson and Walmart. <clears throat> the distinction is very important, right. right? That whether this kind of mergers are forced mergers or they are voluntary mergers. Uh, there are, by the way, there are a lot of antitrust laws associated with that and we are ignoring that for the, point, uh, okay. for the time being and it's not right. It's not right. You have to talk about the legal part, you know, effects of that. So Walmart and Tyson, are vertically integrated in a not sort of in a legal way in the sense that Walmart gets some of the product they sell from Tyson. Right. So you can think of Walmart taking that from Tyson and from other companies as well and uh, acting as the final seller of that. So obviously there's a vertical integration there. But Am I? Like, yes. I'm sorry, it's like they're giving a bigger shelf space to Tyson as opposed to some very, of Tyson's competitors. Very good, very good. So the, the, we can argue the point about horizontal expansion as follows, which you, which you are right, by the way. But I think the, uh, the, your argument comes at the second part of the horizontal integration. The first part is that Tyson is basically selling their product to anyone who comes to the Walmart. And Walmart <coughs> is selling their product to someone who wants to buy a Tyson product. So by doing that, they are both expanding their market share. Right. The second part is extremely important because by replacing or by integrating you know, Tyson inside Walmart, Walmart is also sharing information. And the information is shared not on a vertical level, but on a horizontal level. Because Tyson have their customer base, right? And they are sharing information with Walmart as how the Tyson product should be displayed in the, in the shelf so that it attracts more customers. These are million dollar information. 
which is shared because they have a horizontal merger. And could the same be said for Frito-Lay and Walmart? Yes, any, any of these, hot, wal, Walmart has horizontal integration with all known brands of product that Walmart sells. But you have to understand some of those products became famous because they were sold in Walmart. Yes, and that's a different kind of issue. Right? Okay, I'm done. Any question? Any question about the exam? I have one or question or while you're on the charges. So how would you see the AT&T and Direct TV merging? Uh, I think it's just like uh, Tyson and Walmart. Okay. Regardless of the brand or the type of services they provide, the generic nature of these mergers are either a vertical merger or a horizontal merger. The legal aspect is that they are either forced or voluntary. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure uh, to be able to teach you guys. This is the last time I'm seeing you. Uh, if you have any questions, please send me emails. And um, if you have any question about your past exam, you can put some notes to my mailbox or you can just come and talk with me. Thank you very much. I think it's most likely. Is there anything we need to know about the course project? Oh, hi. Um, no, I mean, uh, sorry. Uh, I guess the course, try to follow the rubrics. Number one. If you want to use some kind of prep tools like a graph or anything that you want to put in your report to make your analysis much richer, just put them in appendix so that you don't uh, violate the you know, page description. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. Yeah. Oh.